Hey guys, thank you for tuning in to the Risen Nation Church podcast. I pray that this message today impact your life and above all, draw you into a deeper encounter with Jesus. I always love speaking because you get a sentia, you know, <laughs> it's like an upgrade. <laughs> Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Hi, it's so good to see you guys. Thank you so much, Noah. Um, I, I brought props. Hope you don't mind. You know, I have a toddler and I'm a visual learner, so it just, it is what it is. <laughs> but um, first I wanted to uh, say thank you to Pastor Costi for letting me speak today. I, it it really, um, it's no small thing who he trusts with your ears. I think that he shepherds you so well and he looks after you so well. And so I don't take it lightly or for granted. So thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, our family's in Tennessee now. We just got our home. We moved in this week. Um, and so today is such a special sweet day for me. I'm super, super excited to be back um, because I've learned so much from this house, specifically this place. Before, um, before I uh, moved to Dallas, my husband and I, we met in Lubbock, and I led worship there, and the Lord called us to DFW, and I guess I just figured I wouldn't lead anymore. Um, and so I, you know, was working at a coffee shop that my husband, uh, he did production at this ministry. I got a job in the coffee shop. Turns out Pastor William uh, was there at the time. And um, there was a, a staff night where the worship leader was, she was sick, so she couldn't sing. And I was like, well, I sing. <laughs> I can play guitar if you want. And uh, the pastor was like, just one song, just one song, you know? And uh, for an hour, I, I was on just the bridge of just one look. <laughs> and I was just sweating. I was like, wait, just one look. You know, it was like really just not great. Um, and like a week later was uh, our very first wedding anniversary. Uh, Jathan and I, we went to Waco and we just happened to run into Pastor William at Magnolia. Uh, of all places. And he was like, man, you're anointed. And I'm like, this guy has no clue what he's talking about. That was terrible. What are you doing? Turns out I had no clue what I was talking about. <laughs> and the Lord, um, the Lord taught me um, to be quiet and listen and learn. I, when I was in Lubbock, I took all of the Worship You classes. I signed up for every seminar. Like I was that guy front row, love it. Um, and then I got here and, um, I realized that maybe, uh, something was missing, you know, because I would watch Pastor William worship and the Lord would land on it all the time, but it broke the rules that I made. Like he would do stuff, right? And I'm like, that's against the rules, <laughs> but God's here, you know? So I had to sit in Panera every Sunday and cry into my soup, you know, freak people out. I'm perfectly fine with crying openly in public. It's really just a problem for Jathan. <laughs> he has to be like, yeah, she's just like this. Don't worry. Like last week, I cried openly in the hurts. <laughs> I felt really bad for the guy. I'm like, sorry, my husband would explain it if he's here. <laughs> uh, but I would literally like wrestle with the Lord in the Panera and be like, God, why? why? You know, I thought, and uh, he led me into a season of unlearning and relearning. And so I've, I've had the honor of learning uh, from our leadership, from Pastor William, Pastor Emily. I love how Pastor Emily worships. She's not someone to be taken lightly as well. Um, but I've also learned about worship from, from you. This is the great thing about a priesthood. And I will never, never take that time for granted. Um, and I'll always, always hold you all in such a special place in my heart. So last time I got to talk to you, I got to share a little bit about what I've been learning. From here, from you, from the book, How to Worship a King by Zach Neese, 
My birthday was April 2nd, so I can't ask you to read it for my birthday, but Christmas is coming up. So for Christmas, you could just read it and then be like, I read the book, Merry Christmas, and then I will be overjoyed. <laughs> I've learned so much from that. Uh, it has very solid theology on worship. Um, and so I pull a lot from, from there. Um, and so I was able to talk to you last time about uh, you are a priest. Today we'll do you are a priest, part two. <laughs> last time we kind of answered the question, what? Right? And we, we went through the outer court. Um, we talked about the responsibility of a priest and what it looks like to practically be in the priesthood. It's not just one. We have one high priest, Jesus, and he's made us into a royal priesthood. The thing about a team is if we rely on one person to pull all of the weight, like Uzzah, they'll die. It's wildly unfair to look at the leader of our priesthood and say, you carry the weight. Not only is it unfair, but it's dangerous. Um, so we made some commitments to each other via the priest creed. Do you guys remember? We're just going to recap real quick. Then we're going to go into part two, I promise. Okay. I've got like a full hour. This is fine. Okay. I am a priest of the Most High God. I worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and will have no other gods besides him. I always place his presence first. I will never allow myself to grow numb to first love. What I feel will never determine his worth. I will be a person of praise, always ready to thank and bless the Lord. I offer my body as a living sacrifice. I will express my love no matter my personality type. I regularly inquire of the Lord and discern what he would like. I am committed to washing in his word daily. I am a minister to him within a royal priesthood. I understand the weight of my role as Jesus paid for me to have it with his precious blood and body. I am a priest of the most high God. We also talked about how we are to approach a holy place. I know all of this might come across as religious, um, and we'll address that today. But the reality of it is, order comes before glory. So it's important for us to have a commitment to order and not just be like a whole bunch of toddlers running around. But I, I keep referencing toddlers. My, my baby girl is now one and I have to chase her 24. I'm out of breath now, I think, because of yesterday still. Also, did I tell you guys I'm pregnant with our second? Did I? Yeah. <laughs> so there's also that. <laughs> uh, so, you know, there will be some more chasing around to do. But it's important that we have order in our home. It's important that there are boundaries. It's important, especially when we're talking about glory. That is not something that's just flippant or lackadaisical. That's something that we hold with a careful, tender hand. Um, okay, so we talked about how do we practically approach this holy place. First, we talked about the gates of praise, right? The prerequisite for worship is praise. The Bible says, blessed are they who know the password of praise. Um, it really is important, and it's step one. Anytime... I meet someone who professes to be a worship leader. Y'all are going to think I'm judgmental, but, uh, um, but they're just like an entirely negative person and just grumpy all the time. I'm kind of like, are you a worship leader or are you a gig musician? You know, because like praise is not a song. It's not like the fast pace, like, you know, praise is like, it's my, a life of acknowledging the greatness of God, no matter the circumstance, no matter the situation. So I should be a person who is actively ready to respond in praise, regardless of what's going on. I'm reading this book right now by Tozer um, on worship. There's a whole chapter dedicated to praise and its importance. Uh, and literally the next week was like one of the hardest, most chaotic, everything went wrong kind of weeks, you know? And uh, I have right on the front of my mind of like, don't be a complainer. <laughs> Praise. I'm like, <laughs> the whole time I'm like, I exalt 
happy. <laughs> but it comes from a deep place. It doesn't come from a place of, I'll praise you so that you fix this. It's not a manipulative thing. It's a perspective change. It's a, I'm choosing to lock eyes with Elohim. I won't be distracted. I won't have my gaze stolen from me. I'll be a person of praise. And this is the gate in which we enter the tabernacle. Next up is the altar of sacrifice. Again, none of this is referring to a song. Now, you may see this in worship, right? Like there are moments, and we talked about it. We talked about the different biblical expressions of worship. Um, they are biblical. Um, and it might make you wildly uncomfortable, but that's okay. Worship is a sacrifice, and sacrifices inherently should not be comfortable, you know? But this is not confined to a music setting. Like praise, it is a life. I think about how Pastor William will often say, if the Lord can get one, he can get the whole family. And I think about my mom. My mom made some really, really difficult decisions when she was really young um, for the Lord. And it essentially had turmoil with her family because, you know, to, to summarize it, she chose God before anything else. And the Lord got one, just one. And my whole life, I've walked him walk her through every situation. And I've seen her choose to remain faithful in every situation. And I get to stand here and deliver a word from the Lord because of her sacrifice. She sacrificed relationships. She sacrificed her reputation. She sacrificed preferences. Sacrifice isn't just lifting your hands. Sacrifice is costly. The Lord asked my husband and I to give a car to a friend. And um, I just sometimes get, I think maybe I'm like Peter sometimes, and then Jathan's like, hey, maybe just like be chill. Be like John, be like John. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so we were like, yeah, we let's, you know, the Lord said, let's do it. No big deal. And I was praying. And you know, after something like that, where you just get kind of like riled up, you know? So I'm like, in prayer, and I'm like, Lord, it's too easy. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, we, Jathan and I do everything together, you know? We only need one car. I didn't even buy the car. I was, it inherited it from my grandmother. Like, that didn't cost me. That didn't hurt. That didn't sting. Ask me for something hard next time. Ask me for my home. I love this home. I don't want to move. Like, I love this backyard. I love the pool. Don't, ask me for, ask me to uproot my family and move to a different state, God. Ask me for something that'll sting, you know? And then, you know, like three months later, Pastor William comes back and is like, hey, so I just got back from doing this documentary in Tennessee. And I cut him off and was like, oh my gosh, are we moving to Tennessee? <laughs> He's like, why would you say that? I don't know. I don't know. I just, I just thought it. <laughs> Jathan's like, maybe before you pray those things, you could just like talk to me and then we could like. <laughs> uh, and on the 13th, I was able to tell the Lord that he is the most important thing with my life, with my decisions, with my home. That's worship. It's not just shouting when you're an introvert. It's not just dancing when you're like, this is, I'm not that kind of person, you know? It goes deeper than that. Now, will your sacrifice be like weighty in this corporate setting? Yes. It just kind of is that way. But this isn't why we do it. We do it because he's worthy. So first is praise, then a sacrifice, and then there's uh, the bronze laver, the washing in the word. And this, um, this references like daily washing in the word of God. It is wildly important that we be a people rooted in the word. Especially, I'm, forgive me, most of my context is that of a worship leader. So you just copy, paste, apply however you want, okay? <laughs> but um, 
you can get away with singing a lot of things you can't say, you know? Uh, and uh, so I have a, like, if I'm songwriting, I'll send it to Pastor William or Joey and be like, is this right? One time I called, I called Pastor Costi. He was like, okay, so I want to say this thing. And it really wasn't controversial at all. But, <laughs> but, but I, I double check because the reality of it is music will move your soul in, in a way that you can just get away with things. And it's actually really important that what we sing um, is biblical and biblically rooted. But it's also important that you know the word enough that um, Christian songs that are not theologically accurate don't move your soul in a direction that he's not walking. It's important that when you hear a message and you know the, the theme seems to be like, just work really hard to be righteous, you're not like, mm, amen. Because there are some things that will um, minister to carnality, you know? Um, but that man is dead and gone. And so it's important to be rooted in the word. It's important to know what God says. Not just what is trendy at the time. Um, not just what sounds right or sounds good. Because a lot of times the enemy will phrase things in a way that sounds really, really amazing. But if it's not true, it's not true. And so um, we talked about this outer court. We talked about how we, we approach. I know that all of this can come across like just a list of rules. Um, when I say like, I will express my love no matter my personality type, for example, I realize this can come across religious. Like, God will take me just as I am. This is true. But what I want to talk to us today in part two of You Are a Priest um, is what motivates the what. What motivates the list? I could look at you and say, okay, let's say, um, you know, um, uh, shouting or like clapping and dancing is not my personality type. I'm an introvert. I just don't do that kind of stuff. I'm really more reserved. Like, God likes it too, you know? <laughs> Which he does. Um, I, if I told you my love languages are as follows. Acts of service, tippy top, words of affirmation, then quality time, and then gifts, and then like a blank space, and then another blank space, and then physical touch. <laughs> I, I don't, when COVID happened and we had to be six feet, I was like, oh, bummer, hi. You know, <laughs> we could do an elbow thing, <laughs> the little chicken arm. Like, I don't, and you guys know this about me. And so graciously, you're like, I know you don't like hugs, so I'm not going to hug you, but just feel embraced right now. And I'm like, it's really not that serious, but all right, we can, we can hug if you want. But if I told you, it is not my, genuinely, God is my witness. It's not my personality type to be like a touchy-feely kind of person. But if I told you, yeah, so I just like never kiss my husband. Because like, I'm, that's just not my personality type. I just like really don't like to like touch them, you know? You would be like, hey, like you, have you considered counseling? <laughs> Maybe you should talk about that. I don't know, like get a mediator. I, that's not normal, you know? The point is love changes things. No matter your personality type. When you fall in love, you turn crazy. My most favorite thing is like engaged couples how they just be posting online pictures of each other being like, so happy I found this man of God. So I never thought this day would happen. It's a dream come true. And I hate when people roast him about it because I'm like, this is such a beautiful reminder of first love. This is honestly, I want to stay in this place. I want to be like, so happy I found this man of God. Like, all the, like I want that to be my heart posture towards my husband all the time. And if I were to come to him and say like, Ugh, don't touch me, you would have pause. If I were to say like, oh, we just really didn't do vows because that's like so religious, just like a list of rules, like ugh, to have and to hold, to love and to cherish. Don't tell me what to do. We know each other enough. He knows me. I know him. I don't need to be told in sickness and in health, you know? It kind of sounds silly because when love walks in, things just change naturally. It's not forced. The truth of it is, the garment of a priest is a weighty one. Just like being a son, bearing his name, that actually has weight. 
but love makes it feel effortless. Um, when I was, I guess, maybe around eight, probably, we lived on an Air Force base. As you guys know, my dad's in the military. And I just was a weird kid, as I'm sure you can imagine. <laughs> I got on base. I saw the neighborhood kids playing in the street, and I walked up and was like, I'm in charge now, okay? And they're like, all right, <laughs> checks out. <laughs> and uh, I literally, I mean, it was like a little gang of kids <laughs> just, and I was like, okay, everyone's dad is overseas, so we, we're each other's family, and we're going to back each other. I mean, I had a list of rules. I was really kind of annoying, but it's fine. Uh, <laughs> there, one day, there, there was a, a kid from Alaska. The first day he moved, uh, and I had all the neighborhood kids like go to his front door, pull him out, greet him, and introduce him to the neighborhood. I'm like, this is our section of the forest. These are where we put our little traps. So don't step there because you'll fall six feet. Like legitimately. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm like, hey, if you need anything, we'll be the first ones there for you. All these things, right? And um, you can imagine just a small city of fatherless kids is probably a hurting one. You know, and so one day uh, a kid from another street came to our street and was talking with the new kid. I mean, this was like a week in, and he uh, accidentally the new kid from Alaska accidentally. Re I remember this so vividly. This was like during Hurricane Katrina, you know, and he had like a fundraising slip and he accidentally tore it. But it was like legitimately an accident. And this guy just snapped and was like, I'm going to kill you. And starts like chasing this. And he's just so small. This, Like Paul Revere, I rode around that street and was like, it's happening. Everybody come out. And these sea of kids just like pounce on this poor stranger. And I'm like, little one, climb. And he like makes it to the top of the soccer post. And I'm like, tell the others, hold this kid down. I'm like, I don't want to hurt him. You know, he's fatherless, like he's hurting. But like, you can't do that to our friend. He's on our street. He's in our family, you know? Um, but the thing about being a military kid is your actions directly uh, affect your father. So that night, Little eight-year-old Kaylee in her Kit Kittredge sailor pajamas. You already, you already know. Those were like the best things in the world. Those are my prized possessions. Uh, had to write a report with the military police. Came to our house. And I literally had to give, this is what, and I stood by it. I was like, listen, he did him dirty. And we defended our own. And my dad was like, yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I literally had to write a report. The kid that instigated everything, also had to write a report. And it negatively affected his father's career in the military. Your dad gets three strikes of a wonky kid before it starts actually affecting uh, their position. I learned at a very young age the effect of, um, or the importance rather, of my father's name and what it meant to carry that. I was Colonel Campbell's daughter. I might have to talk to the military police about that. This is why my daughter's name is Campbell, because the weight of that name has stuck with me all these years. There is a weight to love. There is a weight to carrying his name. But the motivation, or there is a, there's a weight to being a priest. There is a weight to bearing his name. But the motivation for all of this has to be love. And so this is what I want to talk to us about today. I love worship and what Pastor Costi had said, um, because that's literally, I feel the jealousy of the groom this morning. Um, and I don't think it's a small thing. I don't think it's something that we can just kind of be like, yeah, Jesus loves you, moving on. Like it's an actually, it's weighty and it's intense. And when you walk into the holy place, sometimes it's so weighty that you can't stand. It changes everything. Love will change your personality. Love will change how you respond to things. Love will change your paradigms and your perspectives. You'll come in thinking you know how to be a worship leader, and then you realize you don't know anything, and you got to start from scratch. Love just changes things. And so last time we talked about what you are a priest. This time I want to talk about why 
love? The answer is love, not why love. Like, why aren't we a priest? Love. Okay, cool. You get it. Last time we talked about the outer court, and this time I want to talk about the holy place. Okay? Sounds good? Um, back to the, 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 maybe the picture of me being like, yeah, I just don't kiss my husband. It's just like not my personality. You know, kind of silly, kind of ridiculous. Do you know, Zach Neese talks about this in his book. Plug, you should read it, really. It'll change your life. Uh, the, the Greek word most often translated as worship in the New Testament is pronosko. We've heard Pastor William talk about gnosko, which is that knowing, right? Pronosko has three separate translations. Um, the first two are the most common, and the third is a little bit on the controversial side. Ironically, that's what we're going to really lean into. So he talked about it in his book. If you have a problem, you can email Zach. Don't email Pastor Costi, okay? Okay, the first um, definition is to adore. The second definition is to lay prostrate, like straight on your face. And the third definition which is what I really want us to lean into today, is to kiss. The Greek word most often translated in the New Testament for worship, pronosko. The Greek word uh, most often translated in the New Testament for worship is pronosko. Three definitions, to adore, to lay prostrate, or to kiss. Today we're going to lean into to kiss. Um, Luke 7, 44 through 47 says, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears, wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, uh, but he is forgiven little, loves little, sorry. This is the one time in the Gospels that Jesus says someone's demonstrated love for him. As an acts of service girly, I'm always like, I want to prove, I want to show you. I want like, I want an action, you know? This, this uh, Luke 7, the one time Jesus says someone has demonstrated love what I'm trying to communicate today is how you kiss someone communicates a type of relationship that you have with them. Yeah. Okay, as we know, I am not physical touch, but one fateful day, one of the most embarrassing days of my life, I was praying for people in a fire tunnel. You already know. You become a different person in a fire tunnel. I don't know what to tell you. And like my worship elective students were walking through and I don't know what came over me, these are my friends. I don't kiss my friends, right? In different cultures, that's a thing. This one, no, maybe some, I don't know, not me. But I, they're walking through, I'm like, fire of God, you know? And then uh, I, I don't know what came over me, but every time I just, right on the top of the head, just give them a little, little peck right off the top. Sometimes they'd be going down and I'd go down with them. I'd be like, no, come back. <laughs> you know? It's so embarrassing, so unlike me. This is the one time I kissed my friends. It was on the top of the head in a fire tunnel, so you can't judge me. <laughs> then I have my baby, my toddler. Yeah. Anything that is not wrapped in a diaper is fair game. I will munch that little human everywhere. Her cheeks, her ears, her little feet, her belly. Oh, don't get me started. Just die. just love that little baby. If I kissed a friend how I kiss my baby, <laughs> I would not have many friends at all. <laughs> it would be, it, I would at least get called into a pastoral meeting and that would be terrifying. I kiss my husband in a way that I dare not kiss any other human on the face of this earth. Why? Because I have a covenant with him in a way that I don't have with any other human on the face of this earth. How you kiss someone will communicate the relationship that you have with them. The thing, okay, I'm kind of happy that the electric went down <laughs> because this is just, okay, if you're, you know, PG-13, just earmuffs if it's bad, okay. Uh, 
for the married couples in the room, specific. Oh, he earmuffed Noah. <laughs> Danny. <laughs> you can hear Noah. You can hear. It's not that bad. It's not that bad. <laughs> He's just like la la la. Okay, specifically the brides in the room. Have you ever been kissing your husband, but your mind is nowhere to be found? I don't. Okay, is it just me? No. <laughs> Okay, 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 okay. I've seen nods. I've seen nods. I'm talking like, like the pot's boiling over, a baby screaming. Someone has music on way too loud. Like, and that's the moment where he's like, "Kiss me." You know what I'm saying? And you're like, "No." <laughs> or, or you're just like, "Okay," and then you just kind of move on, right? Your soul is somewhere. Your mind, your emotions are somewhere. Your body is not. This happens in worship all the time.、Uh, if we don't understand that love is the thing that motivates the kiss, if we don't understand that love is the thing that inspires the vows, love is the thing that holds all of this together, it really will just be a list of rules, and these lists of rules will get you nowhere.、Um, I want to talk about the holy place. From this perspective, of things that can distract our kiss, things that distract a pronosco from the king. Psalms 42 message, of course, you already know me, says, "Be here, the king is wild for you, since he's your lord, adore him." I think it is、um, easier said than done to be here, to be fully present, fully engaged. To not get complacent, to not grow numb, but to kiss the king, pronosco. And so we're going to talk about different ways that we get distracted, maybe. Okay, but I brought props, so it's okay. The live stream can see the props, and then they'll get it. Okay. First thing is when you walk in. Interestingly enough, the tabernacle is all in sequential order, right? You have the gates, and you have. Uh, the altar sacrifice, and you have the labor. Then you're in the holy place, and then all of a sudden, things split. Now all of a sudden, there's a parallel, and you have a lampstand and the table of showbread. These things are side by side. It's not、uh, sequential anymore. So this tells us that they kind of hold hands in a sense, right?、Um, I think we could get lost four days on each element of furniture and how it applies. Uh, but I'm going to use it to prove my point. So, sorry about you.、Uh, the first thing is it is a lampstand, not a candlestick. Sometimes I hear it referred to as a candlestick, but it's not. These are candles. Candles are little hunks of wax with the wick inside that get lit at the top, and then they burn and 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 then they burn out. And then they get removed and discarded, and replaced with another one. Oh, we can use it now. This one. Hi, Jaden. No way! Is it on? Wow! He just knows things. You know, it makes arguing really difficult. Because <laughs> I'll be like X, and he'll be like No, but Y, and then you know he's right. So. So I guess it makes it. I just got to get over my pride. Okay, it is not a candlestick. It is a lampstand. Candlesticks burn out. They burn to the bottom, and、uh, they get removed and discarded and replaced with another candlestick, and then replaced with another candlestick, and then replace. And it just keeps. I have a lot of candles. Okay. IKEA. <laughs> This is a lampstand or a menorah. It was tended to constantly to stay burning, and there was a constant infilling of oil. Not a burning out, but an infilling. It should tell us something about the heart of the Father. It would illuminate the table of showbread. That was adjacent. The table of showbread is often、um, used to symbolize the provision of God, which I think is absolutely accurate and, and beautiful. But another 
um, instance. Okay, yeah, I'm on the right, sorry. Another, um, another example is um, it's used to describe intimate fellowship between God and his people. I think it's fascinating that a single chapter before the table is described is the story of Moses and the elders going up to dine with the Lord. Right after that story, he's like, oh yeah, and there's a table of showbread made of acacia wood with gold. I think it tells us about the longing of the Lord. Luke 10, 38 through 42, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that she uh, that had to be made. She came to him and asked the Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You're worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Sometimes I think we think that we can prove our love to the Lord by how much we can do or what we can produce. That worship starts to turn into worship. And we come into worship settings, corporate worship settings, entirely burnt out, wondering why. But there's a lack of infilling. He's never called you a candle. We've put ourselves in this position. And we've said, Lord, there's a lot of preparations to be made. Tell my sister. But that's not what he's asking for. What he's asking for is for us to come sit at a table of intimate fellowship that he prepared and provided for, which is illuminated by a lamp that is constantly and filled with fresh oil. He's asking us to simply be here. The king is wild for you. Pronosco. I think that this is probably one of the easiest things to fall into, especially in our Western culture. What can I do? Again, acts of service, I get it, in a big kind of way. I'm like, I wanna serve you, you know? There's nothing wrong with that desire, but if it's not motivated by love, worship happens really fast. Worship turns to worship really quickly. And then all of a sudden we uh, wake up and first love has just seemed to vanish. We wake up and we come in and we're, we're numb. The songs that we sing, we're like, I'm after your heart. And you're like, I'm after your heart. But where's, where's like the genuine, like those words should actually like slap you in the gut. Like to tell the God of the universe, I'm after your heart is actually a privilege and an honor that he paid for with his blood. That should impact us in a really deep way that only love can really hit. Because you remember, love changes things. Love makes you crazy. I think this happens in the modern church all the time, actually. Um, I think we've replaced love with action. So for example, like I was telling you, we moved to Tennessee. And um, I didn't, we signed our lease sight unseen, not the smartest, but every time the Lord tells us to move somewhere, like Dallas, we do the same thing. It just kind of happened. So I just blame God, not me. Okay. Uh, We get there and turns out there's an apple tree in the backyard. Like super, I'm super stoked about it. The neighbor, uh, we thought when we saw it, we were like, ah, crab apples. Okay, (laughs) fine. Uh, Apparently the neighbor gave Jason a tour of the backyard, you know, good thing. Anyways, Uh, um, and uh, he was like, no, that's a a full apple tree. Um, The the problem is there's just way too much fruit. It's overproduced fruit. So what should be large, 
tender, sweet, what should be actually is small, tough, sour. This is what it should be. This, I literally, I was concerned that TSA wouldn't let me bring these. (laughs) But we come to him with our piles of fruit that actually has reduced the quality of fruit. And the word doesn't say, here, let me just, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. It doesn't say every tree that does not bear a lot of fruit. But we've gotten so connected to productivity culture that we have said the more the better, when in fact, it's affecting the quality on our tree. So our neighbor goes on to say, yeah, there's just too many apples. Uh, so, you know, they're all small. If you would just like um, pick them all off, you know, just like strip the, t- the tree of all its fruit. And then you just take time and you care for it. And then you water it. And then one day, maybe there will be some good apples there. You just got to wait. But he was like, but if you don't strip it of all of its fruit right now, if one storm, one bad storm comes, the whole tree crashes down. It's just way too heavy. I think sometimes the American church is way too heavy. We say, oh, Lord, Lord, I made an album. I made all these songs that will impact the kingdom for your name. Oh, Lord, Lord, we have so many different programs Like, uh, there's something for everyone. Everyone's, you know, welcome. All these sound very, very good, by the way. I'm not roast. Like, we're coming out with an album. Quick little plug for you. You know, someday. (laughs) We come to him, say, Lord, Lord, my small group has, like, so many people. And we have amazing teachers and all of these things. And we come to him with all of these things that we've produced, these things that we've made. Oh, you should see how many followers we have on social media. Our reach is just so vast. And he is like, but where's the good fruit? Because I can't eat that. I'll get sick. It's not about the quantity. It's about good fruit. This literally, it's supposed to be a Granny Smith. This is a Granny Smith. This is literally what it's supposed to look like. But like Martha, it's concerned with how much it can produce. It hasn't been tended. So you know what I will do as a good gardener? I will strip that tree of all of its fruit and throw it in the trash. And I will prune it. I'll water it. I'll maybe fertilize it or something. I don't know what farmers do. That's Jathan's domain. And I'll wait patiently. I'm not in a hurry. Hopefully my tree isn't. And then one day, there will be good fruit. And I will have waited maybe years for what, I don't know how apples work. Maybe years or months or however long it takes for an apple. And I will celebrate this one piece of fruit and say, look what I made. It's not about the quantity. It's not about what you can produce. It's not about working for him. All of this is love. My husband doesn't want a bride that just follows marching orders. It would break his heart genuinely. Okay. Next, Altar of Incense. After these two things, we have the altar of incense. Incense, Avi, prayer. But Revelation, just so you know, I'm not crazy. Okay, Revelation 5, 8 through 10. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Rarely is a metaphor ever that obvious. (laughs) Normally I got to like Google it and read a bunch of books and I don't know. Uh, Okay, sorry. (laughs) Then they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and by your blood, you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them a kingdom of priests to our God and they shall reign on the earth. 
this ready just for like an insanely profound statement. Prayer matters to God. Okay. When Jesus flipped the tables, do you remember this story? Okay. He flipped the tables and he says, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. Do you remember? Okay. This, okay. This is a quote. Obviously, it is written. Um, Isaiah 56. Let no foreigner who is bound to the Lord say, the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. Let no eunuch complain. I am only a dry tree. For this is what the Lord says. To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath, who choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant, to them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord, to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it, and who hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer." for all nations. It's interesting to me. The law says the Levites are the ones to enter, right? The Levites are the ones that offer the incense. But in Isaiah, he's saying the eunuchs, the foreigners, the exiles, they're actually going to enter into um, the house of prayer and I'll give them joy there. This is not even Israelites. This is breaking the rules, big time. These are people that are not the right pick. They don't look the part. So what is Jesus communicating in this moment? When he's flipping tables and saying, but my house will be a house of prayer. Maybe it's not about who looks right, who says the right things, who dresses the right way, who's the most religious person in the room, but maybe it's really just the ones who choose what pleases him, who holds fast to the covenant, who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love it, to, to love him, to love his name, to be his servants. This was actually like kind of a loaded statement. Do you remember, like, okay, the rule is Levites, tabernacle, right? But do you remember how the Levites were ordained? He said, okay, Moses goes and he says, whoever is for the Lord, come to me. The Levites were like, I'll bind myself to the Lord. Do you see like the common thread here? So Jesus is really saying like, hey, I'm not actually after like the pretty package. Just choose me. I've chosen you. In this chapter in Isaiah, he actually goes on. Isaiah says, Israel's watchmen are blind. They lack all knowledge. They're all mute dogs. They can't bark. They lie around and dream. They love to sleep. They are dogs with mighty appetites. They never have enough. They are shepherds who lack understanding. They all turn to their own way. They seek their own gain. This reference was really loaded. It wasn't just Jesus being like, hey, I like prayer in the temple. It was Jesus saying, I want my bride back. Nothing can get, like keep a jealous groom from his bride. I wonder why then, when we're approaching the Lord, we kind of tell him, Oh, well, I'm not this. I'm not, I'm not a good prayer. Have you ever, I hear this often. I'm not like a good prayer. I'll leave that to Pastor Costi, who is a fabulous prayer, by the way. <laughs> but like, we will withhold our conversation. We will withhold our connection to the king. We'll withhold our pronosco because we've decided he's not what, or we're not what he's looking for. Or Matthew 6, 6 is one of my most favorites. It says, 
Here's what I want you to do. Find a quiet, secluded place for you. Oh, yeah, thank you. I would trip, too, a thousand percent. (laughs) Here's what I want you to do. Find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there simply and as honestly as you can manage. The focus will shift from you to God, and you will begin to sense his grace. He's never been after fancy words. He's never been after religious lace. He's never been after the ones that look the part. The reason he chose Levi was because Levi chose him when everyone else did it. The reason he chose Zadok is because Zadok chose him when everyone else didn't. And so in this reference, he's saying, the ones that you overlook, the exiles, the foreigners, the eunuchs, I'll give them joy in my house of prayer. But how many times do we either withhold ourselves from the Lord, withhold our pronosco, or we like, this was the best prop I could find. (laughs) Or like how it says in Matthew 6, we role play before God. And we start trying to pray like Pastor Gerardo. Rather than being there as simply and as honestly as we can manage, we present to him someone that we're actually not. The thing about the altar of incense is it's very a revealing place. It's wild, like, uh, this is going to maybe sound a little off-putting, but um, how do I say? Like, I might be just like a little rough around the edges, okay? (laughs) It's fine. Uh, But like, ironically, not really great with words. Uh, Sometimes I, you know, just get a little bit stuck. Uh, And I would put myself in the not great prayer, whatever that means, category. Maybe not ornate, I don't know. But I can tell you that when I pray... I get before God as simply and as honestly as I can manage. And I throw away concern about how my words sound, who's watching and who's listening. And I turn the attention from me to him. And I just honestly and simply say, here I am, Lord. Here's all of me. I want you. I'll bind myself to you. Show me you. And he comes, he's faithful. There have been moments where I have prayed a not so poetic prayer, but an honest one. There have been rooms I've been in where you feel the performance. And I'm just like, God, I want you. I want to see your face. I'll bind myself to you, Jesus. I'm not after sound or recognition. I'm just after your presence, God. And I can feel him come close. It's not pretty, but it's honest. And that's what he asked for. And then maybe someone who gets, like, maybe a little bit insecure sometimes will come and be like, yeah, I'll pray too. And it'll be so much better than what I just said. But it's hollow. It's so poetic. And if you put it on paper, it's just beautiful. But where's the presence? Because he's not after what we think he's after. Where's the broken and contrite? You can't approach the altar of incense playing dress up. There is a certain garment that you wear, and there is no mask on that garment. The thing about Jesus is his eyes are like fire, and they're very revealing. And there are some levels of glory that are reserved for those who are brave enough to fully and honestly present themselves to the Lord that don't just sing songs motivated by religious duty but from a sincere heart posture you know when we're picking the set today um, 
I asked for Haley to sing that last song because I know about Haley's life. And I know that those words are not hollow for my friend. It's not because she sounds good in that key or that song would be good. It's because she is a priest who knows how to simply, plainly present herself before her God. No frills, no show. Just sincerity, just genuine love, just pronounce go. You are his joy. Don't forget. I know we say Jesus loves you all the time, but I pray that the reality of the love of the groom hits your heart this morning. He's jealous for you. When you come to the Lord in prayer, don't give him a version of you that you've decided he wants. Just kiss the king. Okay. After this is the veil. We know the veil has been torn. Praise God. Genuinely, praise God. Sometimes I feel like, well, I, we don't have time. Sometimes, though, I brought props for this part. Okay. Sometimes it's almost as if we try to mend a torn veil. We say, well, I'm just an ugly sinner, disgusting and vile, except for that he called you worthy, except for that he paid the price for proximity. You can't have proximity and um, like a calloused heart at the same time. It just doesn't work. But the thing about the presence of God is it really is intense. So sometimes we'll build up our own walls or our own reasons to have distance, or we'll try to mend the veil. We'll say or do different things that steal our kiss, that steal the pronosco. And it all sounds really beautiful. It all sounds like it should be right. Maybe we're just deciding to cling to the consciousness of our past sin. Hebrews 10, 5 through 23, Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me, and burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken, oh, oh, but a body you have prepared for me, and burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. When he said uh, above, You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifice, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering... He has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. I know this makes us uncomfortable, but it really is the Bible. Let's not mend the veil. It's the truth. And then the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us for after saying... This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there's forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have been, 
or since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the, the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. We enter with confidence. This doesn't mean flippantly. This doesn't mean familiar, familiarly, but confidently. We don't mend the veil even when it's uncomfortable. We just repent. It's as simple as that. Okay. I have 10 minutes. My ask as I transition to Tennessee is that we kiss the king. The outer court, everything we talked about in You Are a Priest Part 1 really is just religious rules without love. When it's not inspired by the love of the groom, which is violent and wild and unimaginable, it just turns into a bunch of checklists. But with love, it turns into vows. So my ask is that we don't try to mend the veil. Let the reality of the sacrifice of the cross hit your heart, even if it's uncomfortable. Let it confront the religion. My ask is that we don't hide ourselves from the Lord like Adam and Eve in the very beginning, but we come to him as simply and as honestly as we can manage and say, here I am, God. I want you. Be here. The king is wild for you. Since he's your Lord, adore him. My ask is that we don't settle for a lot and get so busy that we forget to kiss him or get so caught in what we can do for him that we turn worship into worship. I know it's like a little bit somber, but the holy place should be. So can I show you then, after all this, can I then show you what worship would look like? Okay. Pause. No one, no one make a sound. What's happening in your body right now? Are you, is your heart going faster? Are you upset with me that I made a mess? Are you wondering who's going to clean that mess? Is it like kind of awkward? So you just kind of want to fill the silence? Can I show you what holy looks like? Can I show you what pronosco looks like? What this communion, what this covenant looks like?
sometimes it's awkward. Sometimes it's quiet. Sometimes it's nothing that you would expect. Sometimes it's messy. Sometimes there's a big crash. It's never been our job to tell God how he gets to be worshiped. It's our honor to set a table. This is a holy place. After the veil is the most holy place. Once a year, the high priest would go in and sprinkle blood on the mercy seat. Your high priest sprinkled his own blood on the mercy seat. The day of atonement. Jesus loves you fully. He put his body where his mouth is. Pronosco, be here. The king is wild for you. This place is not for us to dictate, but to dine. And so we sit and we say, I love you, Jesus. I want you, Jesus. Bind me to you, God. I'll cling to our covenant. I want to fall deeper in love with you. And sometimes the words aren't pretty, but they're honest. Sometimes it's not poetic, but it's true. And it comes from a deep place. This is the holy place. It feels almost impossible to have empty songs here. When you're confronted with the bread and the wine and the reality of the love of Christ, words just can't be empty. So I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. You're worthy, Jesus. You're holy, Jesus. Not my will, but your will, Jesus. I want to eat the whole lamb. You're beautiful, Jesus. Thank you for loving me, God. I love you back. I love you too. David knew there was something more than the ark of your presence. In a manger, Messiah was born. Among kings and peasants, all of Israel saw the glory. And it shines down through the age. Now you ask me to boldly seek your face. Show me your face, Lord. Show me your and then gird up my legs that I might stand in this holy place show me your face Lord your power I will make it to the end if 
If I could just see your face Cause Jesus, I love you, I love you, I love you Jesus, I love you, I love you, I love you Jesus, I love you, I love you, I love more than anything, more than anything. Jesus, I love you, I love you, I love you. Jesus, I love you, I love you, I love you. Jesus, I love you, I love you, I love you. More than anything, more than anything. We love you, Jesus. It is an honor to be a royal priesthood in a holy nation. We take it seriously, God. But I won't reduce what you paid for to a mere set of rules or a list to check off. Thank you for loving me. I love you too. You're a worthy Lamb of God. In this house, may the Lamb receive the reward of his suffering. I know that when I say things like, um, our indifference is hostile towards the Spirit of God. And I would rather you not be here than to be hostile towards the one I love. It sounds really intense and borderline mean. But the problem is, love makes you go a little bit crazy. And I'm a little bit crazy. When you've sat at this table, when you've tasted and seen when you've handled him, nothing else will do. No program, no awesome build in a song, no fear of man, nothing else satisfies like this meal. I am so, so, so honored to have learned to worship alongside of you. And I am so, so looking forward to learning some more when I go to Tennessee. But promise me, you'll never stop kissing the king here. Promise me that the set list won't be your starting point, that you will be a people of praise. That is a life of praise, not a song. That you're a people who communicates just how worthy you truly believe him to be by how eager you are to sacrifice your everything for him. You're a people who cherish the word Wash yourself in the word. You're a people who are consistently infilled and don't substitute oil for wax. You're a people who sit at a table of intimate fellowship. You're a people who 
don't role play before God, but present yourself simply and honestly. You're a people who walk through the curtain, which is his body, into a holy place. And you don't grow numb to that. You don't get complacent with that. Complacency and proximity can't coexist. It's been such a joy to get to serve in this capacity with you. Thank you again for joining us for this podcast. We pray that above all, your life was touched by his presence. If you're interested in learning more about the church or getting plugged in, you can visit us at www.risennation.org or follow us on social media to stay up to date with all that God is doing here. We love you guys. God bless.